So turn to Revelation chapter 4. We got through the first six verses last time. We saw chapter 4 verse 1 is where I believe the rapture of the church takes place in the book of Revelation. John is on the island of Patmos writing his seven, uh, the seven letters that Jesus gave him to write. And then in verse 1, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, and we saw in chapter 1, that trumpet behind John was Jesus himself. And here it says, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And we saw this is the third part of the three-part outline for the book of Revelation, chapter 1 is, you know, because chapter 119 says, uh, this is the outline, write the things which you have seen, past tense. What he saw was the vision of the glorified Jesus. Write the things which are, he tells us the things which are, are the seven churches, chapters 2 and 3. And then he says, write the things which take place after these things. And that's what we start off with in chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, the Greek word metatauta, and so from this point on, everything is in the future. Everything is from the perspective of heaven. And so immediately John is removed from the earth. He's in the spirit. He sees the very throne room of God. He sees the throne of God. And uh, as we talked about, this is the ultimate seat of authority. This is where God rules and reigns over the entire universe. John saw God himself on this throne. The only way he can describe him is by saying God is like a crystal clear, diamond-like jasper stone, as pure and bright, like nothing you could imagine. I could only imagine. You know, we, we can't. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, he says God is like a, a bright red ruby, a sardius stone in appearance. He sees this emerald rainbow, like a halo around the throne of God, and he is just blown away. And we left off in verse 6 where it says, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. In other words, it's not liquid, it's solid. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And so John sees these four amazing angelic beings known as cherubim that are hovering around the throne of God. Um, Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10 gives us more detail about these cherubim. That's what they're called there. And these were some of the mightiest angels that God created. In fact, Lucifer, before he fell into sin, uh, was called a cherub. He was around the throne of God as well. This is what we're told in Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 14, about Lucifer. God says, You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So what was the iniquity found in Lucifer? Well, Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12, tells us how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will, and these are the five I wills of Lucifer that gets him kicked out of heaven. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And this is the lie that he perpetuates upon the world. I will be like the Most High. And God's assessment is, Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit." And so Lucifer was brought down by his foolish pride. And, and that's really his most effective, that's his greatest weapon against humanity, is to appeal to our pride. This is what he uses to destroy families, to destroy marriages, nations. He appeals to our fleshly pride. 
Uh, that was his tactic that he did in the Garden of Eden. This is how he got Adam and Eve to sin and rebel against God. This is what we read in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that's God's promise. They were going to die if they ate of that one tree, the forbidden tree, tree of knowledge of good and evil. All these, I mean, probably millions of trees that they could have eaten from and just enjoyed fellowship with God. But he gave them that one because love requires choice and they chose wrongly. So in Genesis 3, verses 4 through 6, Satan lures them in when he appeals to Eve's pride. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So he contradicts God's word. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. That's his big lie. Knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of it, uh, took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her so he's just sitting there listening to all this, and he ate as well. So Satan appealed to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are the same things that John writes about in 1 John. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. These are the exact same three temptations Satan brings against Jesus when he's tempting him in the wilderness. But all three times Jesus you know, stood on the word of God, and he said, it is written, and he came against these temptations. That's a good lesson for all of us to remember. Stand upon the truth of God's word. Hold fast to the Lord's promises, because Satan is going to try to lure you into whatever compromising situation you find yourself in. Uh, and by the way, after Adam and Eve fell into sin, and they ruined their relationship with the Lord, it says, God drove them out of the garden, and he places the cherubim in front of the tree of life. And uh, it kept them from going back and eating from the tree of life and staying in their sin forever. So we read in Genesis 3.24, So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, these mighty angels, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so again, these cherubim, they're just awesome, angelic creatures that serve God. They, they do various things for God. We see four of them around the throne of God here. And so look at verse 7 once again. This description that we're given, it says, The first living creature was like, not he is, but he's like a lion. The second living creature, like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Uh, again, according to Ezekiel chapter 1, each of these four cherubim, each one of them had four faces, and it describes these same characteristics. A face like a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle. Uh, many Christians, beginning in the first century, saw a similarity between this and the four Gospels, as you look at the four Gospels, Matthew describes Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we have the lion. Mark describes Jesus as the beast of burden, the servant, that is the ox or the calf. Um, the Gospel of Luke pictures Jesus as the perfect son of man. So we have the face of the man. And then the Gospel of John gives us more about the deity of Christ, thus the, uh, you know, he's the eagle represented there. Now again, what John is seeing here is the real deal. He's in the throne room of God. He's seeing God in all of his glory, all of his splendor. Um, God tells Moses to, you know, build this model. And it's a model based on these things we read about in chapters 4 and 5 and chapters 21 and 22. That's the real deal in heaven. So when Moses, he's instructed to build the tabernacle, and the heart of that was the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant that represents the throne of God. The Shekinah glory would come down upon the Ark of the Covenant. Anytime they moved, they could only move the Ark and the tabernacle when the glory of the Lord moved. You know, the Shekinah glory, the cloud by 
day, the pillar of fire by night, and that was the only time they would move. And then when they set up camp, when the cloud would stop, they would put everything back together, build it in the tabernacle, all the you know, fencing around it, so to speak, and all the things that went into it. And then the Levites would camp right around it. But then something very interesting was told in uh, Numbers chapter 2, because every time they stopped, the 12 tribes would get in a specific order. Three tribes would be on each side of this tabernacle in the middle. And then there would be you know, tribes this way, tribes this way, and a tribe this way. And so real quickly, let me go through this. Um, when they, when you look at this in Numbers chapter 2, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, that was one of the tribes, it was the biggest tribe, they, they made up 186,000 Jews, and their insignia, their banner over their tribe was the lion, okay, 186,000, it went one direction. And then you had the tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. They were 108,000, so a little bit shorter, just opposite. So you have a long tribe here, shorter tribe there, 108,000. And their insignia was an ox. Then you had Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, 151,000 going this way. And their insignia was the face of a man. And then you had Dan, Naphtali, and Asher, 157,000 going this way. Their insignia, their banner was the eagle. So that's the model of what we're seeing here in glory. Face of a man, ox, lion, and um, ox, lamb, lion, eagle. <laughs> okay, you got it. So you're following. So the interesting thing, though, because right after that, you read about Balaam, the prophet. He was hired by King Balak of Moab. And as they're coming through, the Israelites are coming through, they set up camp, and Balak doesn't like the Jews being in his territory, so he hires Balaam to curse them. And so he says, I want you to curse them, and God wouldn't allow him to curse them. Here's an interesting thing to think about because he went up on top of three mountains, it says, high places, and from that mountain he would look down and see the tribes of Israel, what are they shaped as? This way. Shaped as a cross with the tabernacle in the middle. And so every time he went to curse them, the only thing that came out was a blessing. He goes up on another high mountain, different angle. He looks down, he sees the shape of the cross. And he couldn't curse them, he could only bless them. Did that three times. What that tells me is God won't allow his people to be cursed because they're covered by the cross of Christ. It takes more significance when we look at the fact that we're in the shadow of the cross. Jesus' blood covers us of all of our sins. So when Satan comes against you, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can stand upon the finished work of the cross. So pretty interesting scenario here. So we got the real deal here, these four living creatures. Now look at verse 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, so nothing escapes their notice, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So how amazing is this? I mean, they, they never cease worshiping the Lord. They Never get bored being in the presence of the Lord. You know, one of the things that's going to make heaven so amazing is the constant, perpetual worship of God that will be going on. And we can't even imagine how awesome it's going to be to worship Him in our resurrection bodies. Because just face it, today in these bodies, you know, we, I don't know about you, but my mind drifts. You know, my mind just, you know, gets caught up in things. And, you know, yeah, we're singing, I can only imagine how the Broncos are going to do tomorrow. No, they don't play today. They have a bye week. They're, they're playing next week. And then it's like, oh, come on, get back focused, you know. And it's so easy to get caught up and just drift. And Paderborn's got three and a half feet of snow. We can worship the Lord on the mountain. I mean, it's just like, no, focus. Colossians 1. <laughs> Verse three, uh, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, like the Broncos. 
For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so, you know, our BB brains are so prone to wander and it's like, squirrel, you know, you get all caught up in so many silly things. But notice also what they say as they worship the Lord here. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy is God. That is his nature. That is his character. He is perfect in every way. He is spotless in every way. He is not. He cannot be tainted by sin. He is holy. Don't forget, God is eternal. God is infinite. He's without beginning and without end. And, and so they proclaim who was and is and is to come. And, and so we've seen in chapter 1, this refers to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus takes his title to himself. This is what Jesus said. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and is to come. So make no mistake about it. Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now check out what happens next. Verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. So remember, we saw last week the 24 elders represents the entire body of Christ. When we're watching that, you know, Operation Christmas Child video, I mean, you see all these little kids from all these different countries. Well, that's what heaven's going to be like. It says there'll be people from every tribe, tongue, nation, every people group. It's going to be glorious. And so 24 elders represents the entire body of Christ. When we're, and I mentioned last time that when uh, David was setting up the priesthood, they would have 24 priests that would work in the temple only 24 at a time, but they had 24,000 priests, but only 24 at a time. And so maybe that's what this is a reference to. They represent all of us. We will be there, but how glorious is it going to be? Because we saw that the 24 elders are clothed in white. Jesus says to the overcomers, you'll be clothed in white, crown of, on their heads, we'll be wearing crowns, seating on thrones, they're on lesser thrones. So I think that represents the body of Christ. And notice they cast their crowns before God's throne. You've heard of the band Casting Crowns. That's where they get their name from. By the way, these crowns that we'll be wearing they're known as Stephanos. The Greek word is Stephanos. It's a victor's crown. Jesus wears a different crown. His is the diadema or the diadem, the crown of authority, the crown of a king. So we're wearing lesser thrones, Stephanos. But these crowns that we receive, there's five mentioned in the New Testament, and they're based on our faithfulness to the Lord, what we do for the Lord. Some of us will have one, some may have two, some may have five. I don't know. But whatever we do, whatever crowns we're given, we're going to cast them at his feet. But let me give you an example of some of these crowns. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So simply loving Jesus, he'll give you a crown. 1 Peter 5, 4, and speaking about being a faithful servant leader among God's people, Peter says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, this is where Paul's speaking of a crown given to those who simply tell others about Jesus. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. We saw in chapter 2, verse 10, that to the church of Smyrna, those who were being persecuted, martyred for their faith, they were given the crown of life as well. And then Paul talks about a crown that's going to be given simply because we love the appearing of the Lord, his first coming and his second coming. Second Timothy 4, verse 8, Paul says, Finally, there is laid, upon, uh, laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, 
and not to me only, but, uh, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So anyway, what are we going to do with any or all the crowns he gives us, he rewards us with? Well, we just cast them at his feet because we know he alone is worthy. And we're going to sing out verse 11. Learn this little verse now because we'll be singing this in heaven. We'll be saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. In other words, it's going to be so obvious to all of us that Jesus Christ alone is worthy. We don't deserve anything good and glorious from God. It'll be obvious that Jesus deserves all praise and honor and power and glory. It says here he's the creator of all things. And so that means you were created by God. We exist for his will. We exist for his glory. We exist for his good pleasure, not our own. Think about this. When we were lost, he rescued us. When we were dead in our sins, he paid the price to redeem us through the shedding of his blood. When we were you know, blind, he opened up our eyes to see our need for salvation. Again, everything, anything good, anything good, glorious, you might say, in our lives, we owe it all to Jesus. Now, we may not fully understand and appreciate that today, but we certainly will when we see him face to face. But realize this, you were created by God. You weren't an accident. You, you didn't crawl out from some swamp goo. You know, what's that old saying from goo to you by way of the zoo? No. <laughs> You were created with, by God. He has a plan and purpose for all of our lives. You're not a mistake. Now, as we come into chapter 5, the, the scene takes a dramatic turn here. The Apostle John is going to witness something truly amazing. In fact, not only does he witness this great event, he finds himself in the midst of this thing as it takes place, and he finds himself in a very vulnerable position here because We'll see him, see in a moment, he is going to just start weeping. He's going to start convulsing. He's going to be crying. In fact, this event in chapter 5 is a foundation upon which the very next 15 verses are built upon. Not verses, the next 15 chapters are built upon this scene that we're going to look at now. It all has to do with this scroll that we're going to read about. Jesus in this rolled up scroll. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that's the Father, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Again, the one who's seated on the throne is the Father. He's holding a right in his right hand this scroll. It's sealed. It's a rolled up document. It's got writing inside and outside. But take note of that. This is very important, that it is sealed with seven seals. And it's those seven seals that are going to be vital to, again, the next 15 chapters in the book of Revelation. Because every time he undoes one of these seals, it's part of God's wrath is going to be let loose upon this Christ-rejecting world. When he opens the seventh seal, that's not the end. That brings seven trumpet judgments. When he blows the seventh trumpet, that's not the end. It brings seven bowl judgments. And he's going to just obliterate planet Earth during this seven-year period we call the Great Tribulation. So this seven-sealed scroll, very, very important. And in, in biblical days, scrolls were very common. Um, you know, they would write primarily on papyrus if it was a small scroll. They would write on vellum or animal skins if it was something lo larger. If you remember years, uh, about 12 years ago now, we had the great scroll of Isaiah, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We had the, one of the only three uh, facsimiles of that, exact copy of it. And it went 25 feet across this whole area here. It was amazing. And it was all vellum. And you can still see the stitching where they stitched together with leather straps. I mean, it was dated 150 B.C. Anyway, scrolls were the most common form of documentation. And if there was a legal document, that's when they would use seals. 
They only put seals on a legal document. So take note of that. This is how it worked. If uh, you bought someone's property in Israel back then, they would have two deeds written up. One of the deeds would be kept in storage, and the other deed would be kept by the original owner, and it would be sealed. If you own the property, but you had to sell it, or you lost the property, you had to forfeit it, in Israel, there was the possibility of getting your property back, but there were some things that were required, that you had to meet these requirements in order to get your property back. Um, it's called the uh, Kinsman Redeemer plan that God came up with. And once the conditions were met, you would take the original scroll and then you would undo the seals and you'd open it up. And then you would read, okay, all the documentation about that property. And so, very important. On the other hand, if you could not fulfill the legal requirement yourself... The Lord gave them a backup plan. Here's the verse. It's Leviticus 25, verse 25. It says, If one of your brethren becomes poor and has uh, sold some of his possession, so he's pressured into he had to sell his property, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Again, this is the kinsman redeemer plan. So that is when a close relative could buy back the property for the relative if he met three conditions. First of all, he had to be a close relative. He couldn't be some you know, other person in the village. He had to be a relative, a cousin, aunt, or uncle, or someone. They had to be a relative. Secondly, he must be able to pay the redemption price. He couldn't just say, I'm a relative, give it to me. No, they had to be able to pay it. And then thirdly, they had to be willing to pay. Just because your cousin, you know, blew it, he lost the property, didn't mean you had to buy it back for him. But if you're willing to do it, then you met that qualification. That's the kinsman redeemer plan. In Hebrew, it was known as the goel. Those of you that study the book of Ruth, that's primarily what the book of Ruth is all about. You remember Naomi has to leave Israel. There's a famine. They go to Moab. While she's there, she's got two sons, her husband. Her husband dies. Then her two sons die. They were married, but they die. And so she has nothing. She has nothing to her name. So she goes back to Israel. Ruth, the Moabitess, wants to go back with her. And so she goes back. Long story short, too late. Long story short, Ruth marries Boaz, who is a relative of Naomi. And because of that marriage, then he becomes the kinsman redeemer. And so the property goes back to Naomi. It all stayed in the family because Boaz was willing and he was able to buy back this property. Another good example is found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32. God tells Jeremiah, just before the invasion of the Babylonians, go buy your cousin's field. A lot of good that's going to do. We're going to be out of here for 70 years. But he buys the field. And it was, you know, an important thing. So he has these... Um, documents signed and sealed. He keeps one of the deeds, and the second deed stays unsealed. It, it remains sealed. Now, the deed with the seals on it could only be opened when and if the original owner was able to reclaim the property or one of his kinsmen redeemers. So this scroll we see here in chapter 5, it's still sealed up, which means it's very important. It hasn't been opened yet. First of all, notice here in verse 1, God has it in his right hand. That's his hand of authority. Since this scroll is still sealed, that means the original owner is God himself. As you go through these things, and we'll go through some of the scriptures, I believe this is the title deed to planet Earth that God is holding in his hands. This is why this scroll is so important. And it's only after it's opened and all the seals are broken, that God will reclaim this planet back to himself. Look at verse 2. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Here's the sad response. No one in heaven or on the earth 
or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And this is John's response. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Now, you might be thinking, well, God is the creator and sustainer of life. He's the one that created planet Earth. God is the one who is the sustainer of planet Earth. So why does he need to redeem and reclaim that which is already his? Psalm 40, uh, 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. That's what it tells us, but this is where things get interesting because after God created planet Earth, God then created Adam and Eve. He places them in the garden, and in a sense, picture God giving them the title deed to planet Earth. This is what God tells them in Genesis 1.28. Then God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. That means you're taking control over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so again, God put Adam in charge. It's like he gave him the title deed to planet earth. But when Adam and Eve fell into sin, as we saw earlier, when they disobeyed God, they believed the lie of Satan, they literally handed the title deed to this planet over to Satan. And as a result of their disobedience in Genesis chapter 3, that curse remains on the earth to this day because God cursed the earth at that time. Paul says this in Romans 8 verse 20, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption, that's what we're presently under, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. But when Adam and Eve obeyed Satan instead of God, it resulted in their spiritual death, but also they became slaves to Satan. This is what Romans 6.16 tells us. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that's what they did when they believed Satan's lie and ate the forbidden fruit, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So when they sinned, they also forfeited the title deed to earth over to Satan. And again, this is why you know, Jesus calls him the ruler of this world. Look at this verse, John 14, verse 30. Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world, that Satan, is coming and he has nothing in me if you read 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, it tells us, you know, Paul says Satan is the god of this world. He's a prince of the power of the air. And that's because he has the legal right to this planet at this time. People want to blame God for all the things that go wrong in our world, all the hurricanes and earthquakes and everything else. Satan is the reason. God allows it, but Satan is behind it. The clearest depiction we have of Satan being in control, having the authority, having the title deed to planet Earth, it's found in the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 5. This is what it says. Then the devil, taking him, Jesus, up on a high mountain, showed him, notice, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered. That literally means this has been handed over to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. This is Satan talking. Therefore, if you, if you, Jesus, will worship me, all will be yours. Jesus doesn't dispute the fact that Satan has that authority to offer this to him. The problem is Satan is telling Jesus, I know why you're here. You're here to die. You're here to redeem this world. You're here to shed your blood. You're going to be put to death. That's why God sent you here. But here's a shortcut. 
You bow down and worship me, I'll give you the title deed to planet Earth. That was the temptation. And so Jesus obviously rejected that wicked temptation because Jesus knew that the only legitimate way to redeem this world and all of us in this world was through the only acceptable payment that God required, which was the shedding of blood, Jesus' blood, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So in Luke 4, 8, Jesus answered and said to Satan, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. But again, Jesus did not dispute the fact that this world has been handed over and delivered to Satan. Again, Jesus Christ came to earth 2,000 years ago to redeem, purchase his world back to God, and he did it through his shedding of his blood. But you know what? Even though the price has been paid, he doesn't collect that title deed until we read about it here. And then when he comes back at his second coming, that's when Satan will be dealt with. That's when the Antichrist will be dealt with. So technically, this world belongs to Jesus. He paid the redemption price. He just hasn't picked it up yet. Satan knows his time is short. And so he's doing all that he can to try to steal, kill, and destroy as many people as he can. And he wants to drag as many people with him into the lake of fire as he possibly can. But go back to that question in verse 2. Look at that again. Who is worthy? Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? First of all, notice it does not say who is willing to take the scroll. There's been a lot of people in this world over the last well, since creation, basically, who have been willing to rule this world. Hitler, Mao Zedong, I mean, you can go down the list of all these world rulers. They wanted this title deed. They wanted to take over the world. And that's what we see without, you know, throughout world history. Basically, one ruler trying to conquer another ruler, one nation trying to conquer another nation, but no world leader is worthy. Only Jesus is. No religious leader is worthy, only Jesus is. Jesus is the great I am. That means the rest of us are the great I ain'ts. So don't ever forget that. This should also prove that humans cannot govern themselves. And this Tuesday, we get to prove it again. I encourage you to vote. We've been hearing a lot of weird stuff from certain political parties that this is the end of democracy. If you vote for Republicans, you know what? This nation was founded as a republic. The difference is a republic means it's based on law that you're not to change. When the founding fathers set up our republic, it would meant we're going to base it off, and they based the Constitution off the Word of God, and that was not to change. A democracy, and this is how Frank, uh, Benjamin Franklin described democracy, two wolves and a sheep lying down together, talking about deciding what's for dinner. That's what he said a democracy is. Two wolves and a sheep lying down together deciding what's for dinner. Mob rule is where democracy will lead to if you don't stay under the republic, under the laws of God. Well, we're pushing God out. We're pushing the Constitution out. We want to do everything our way. And we're becoming just like the time in the times of judges where people were doing what's right in their own eyes. And if we keep pushing God away and voting for people that push God away, we're going to be mob rule. That's the bottom line. So vote your conscience. Vote what you feel is right. It's very important. Back to this. I'll get off my soapbox. Put yourself in John's sandals here for a moment. When the angel asked this question with a loud voice, and it says everyone could hear this voice, I mean, who is worthy? He's proclaiming this, and everybody in the universe probably can hear this because it says no one in heaven, no one on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. And so John's response in verse 4 is he wept much. It means he started weeping, convulsing uncontrollably because in his mind at that very moment, he's thinking, it's lost. Everything's going to be under Satan's domain forever. This world is going down. And he's weeping uncontrollably because he thinks at that moment, 
I would think the same thing, I'm sure. If nobody could step forward, this is going to be in Satan's control forever? That's unfathomable to think about. So he lost all hope, and he's thinking, great, Satan is going to continue to deceive and kill and destroy that thought is horrifying to John. That's why he's weeping so much here. No one was worthy to be our kinsman redeemer. So again, John is weeping. He's sobbing. The fact that not one person or even an angel was worthy to redeem us and take the title deed to planet Earth and open its seals and reclaim this world back to God, that, that's just blowing his mind. But notice in verse 5, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. That means David came from Jesus. Jesus is the creator. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. In other words, stop weeping, John. I've got glorious, great news. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of, you know, King David, Jesus Christ, the conquering king, he is worthy. He has prevailed. And I, I can imagine John's hope, boom, so fast. He's like, of course, it's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. And it just clicks at that moment. John once again realized that Jesus is in control. He alone in all the universe is worthy to take this scroll, to open it up, and what's going to proceed is because of the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And so look at verse 6. He's told, Behold the lion. And I looked, verse 6, And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. He's expecting to see a lion, but he sees a lamb. Now, who in heaven would be lying to you? <laughs> He's like, the lion, of course. He looks back. It's the lamb? But notice, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. This is Jesus, still bearing the marks of the crucifixion a forever memorial of his goodness and grace and love and compassion towards us. Stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns. The horn represents authority, power. Seven, again, we've seen 54 times in Revelation, number seven is used, means completeness. So he's seeing Jesus, complete power, seven eyes, complete wisdom, which are the seven spirits of God. We've talked about the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God, sent out into all the world. Then he came, Jesus, the Lamb of God, and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And so when John looks up, he sees Jesus, and he realizes he is our kinsman redeemer. He alone has fulfilled the three requirements. He has to be of a near kin. Well, that's what... John 1.1 1, 1 and 1.14 is all about, remember, the three requirements. He had to be a close relative. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. That's God. Jesus is the Word. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as if the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so he meets that first requirement. He's a close relative. He had to be able to pay the price. What was the price he paid? His perfect spotless blood. Was he able to do it? Well, this is what Peter tells us. 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 18. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received from the, by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So he was able to pay the price. Third thing, he had to be willing to pay the price. Was he willing? Of course he was. John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. 
So what an awesome Lord and Savior we have in Jesus. He willingly went to the cross. He willingly died in your place, which is the greatest proof of his love for us. John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's why he loved the world. That's why he sent Jesus. For God so loved the world, he gave a free gift. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'll close with this, Matthew 13, 44. Jesus said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field again the treasure he's after is you and me the pearl of great price in that same section that pearl is you and me he sells all that he has because he wanted to purchase us and he gave all that he had to bring us into heaven Think about that the next time you have fears, you have doubts, you question God's love for you. You feel worthless, you feel rotten. Just remember, He loves you so much, He came to die in your place. And so not only does Jesus hold, right now He's holding the title deed to planet Earth in His hand, He holds a title deed to your life in His hands as well. And he loves you, and he will stay with you. He'll stick closer to you than any brother. And when we pick up next time, starting in verse 8, the result of what Jesus just does, taking this scroll from the Father's right hand, is an unbelievable worship service. The greatest worship service of all time, and we will be there. So learn the lines now. <laughs> So when we get up there, we're like, oh, what comes next? We'll know what comes next.